What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 237 at block height 647,959 on Saturday, September 12th. So what's up, Janine? I cannot wait for the hiatus. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I'm kind of looking forward to that at this point, too. This month is going to kill me. Yeah. Well, work work piles up. So, uh, yeah, big holiday yesterday. So some, something I noticed, although asking a few people and poking around, it seems like this was more just my timeline. But uh, I really did not see any of the usual landmark tweets and rants that happen every year on this day. Uh calling out shenanigans and things don't make sense or explain this but i saw quite a lot of brand new heroes from that morning that we never heard about until this year and just way more of a weird patriotic rah-rah like tone to everything than there usually is if you know what i mean no i don't know what you mean because i feel like the uh well, as I call it, memorial porn is uh, quite strong every single year, and I don't really notice a difference. And I almost forgot yesterday was what yesterday is until an American reminded me. <laughs> it's just just a little a little thicker than usual. Like here are all these stories never told until this year that you didn't hear about. Like we need new material, otherwise. The rah-rah is fading. Yeah, well, too bad there's not enough rah-rah about all of the things that that event enabled. Like, um, you know, surveillance state. Mm-hmm. It's especially weird this year just thinking back to all of that shit happening and just seeing the parallels with this year and uh, corona and everything. They hate us for our freedoms, so let's hate our freedoms for them. Mm-hmm. Anyway, though, uh, want to get into this first one? Yep. So, uh, yeah. I just gave the, the talk last weekend at uh, the PlubSec conference online about regulatory capture, and part of uh, the end of my talk was bringing up the fact that regulation is likely coming for miners um, in terms of the next thing on the horizon with regulators trying to strangle things. And I didn't know at the time that literally within the last week um, that had actually started happening. But it's not really regulators in and of themselves. Um, it's some private companies pushing for it. Um, so th there is this new site and movement called Know Your Hash Rate, um, funded by SLIC, um, a private company, and I think the other um, company is Block Trace. Um, but it's it's pretty much like an AML KYC scoring service for different exchanges, and um, yeah. This company with this super vague website that doesn't really explain what they're doing or what their business model is, but if you look very closely at a projected timeline of all the money they want to raise, around 2022, um, they're investing in green energy to vertically integrate. And then 2023, right before the happening the year after, they're going to design and manufacture ASICs and GPUs. Hmm. Wait, what? 
so um yeah they're they're gonna start mining it looks like um in a couple of years and and plastered all over the website is the phrase market timing timing the market correctly um so this company that is is trying to obscure that business model um it seems like they're getting into um is pushing for all of this know your hash rate shit and the core of it i'm not really sure um how accurate their interpretation of fatf guidance is um in some ways uh, i think it's on the nose but i do kind of you know ask myself whether some of the other interpretations of things are quite accurate but they're trying to look at the travel rule um and the recommendation for that for virtual asset service providers and apply that to miners um and in the sense of just anything um handling money custodially for other parties um i think that they're um gonna sway the fatf to their line of thinking in terms of well mining pools should know who they're uh, paying money out to but the general gist is um under the these guidance for the, the travel rule for different VASPs, they're now bringing up miners in that equation um, and drawing all kinds of um, worries there in terms of, you know, do these pools KYC anybody? Do you really know the jurisdiction that, that some of this hash rate in? Hey, that could be a sanctioned country. Oh, also, did you know that a lot of mining is, is powered by fossil fuels, which means if there's CO2 pollution, then um, investors and other institutional players who have to deal with carbon credits and stuff like that can't invest. Oh, and again, you know, the um, the whole tax issue, like are our miners paying their taxes properly? Is this all identified? Do you know who's actually doing any of this? No. So there's all kinds of anti-money laundering problems here. And their rationale and part of what they want to do with this service is offer attestations of mined coins to prove that through the whole way, there's there's no carbon emissions, there's no sanctioned countries doing anything um, because we can um, record and show proofs of all of this. <laughs> And um, yeah, they're literally developing similar to the FATF travel rule uh, data standards, um, their own proposal, um, mining uh, know your hash rate standard 42, um, where mining pools would commit um, specific information in Coinbase's related to the pools um, and registered identities, but that also um, mining pools would keep and maintain records of things like the registered account, the legal identity, the withdrawal address of individual hashers at the mining pool. So start trying to apply all of this KYC overlay shit um, at the mining level um, and not just the exchange level. And that, that brings into, er, into question interesting synergies that can happen there if you have everybody's information getting tagged at these exchanges, and then you also have the miners getting tagged in the same way and beholden to the same regulatory regime. Um, you know, they might start censoring things um, because it's owned by this guy and no, no, no. That's the direction this can start going in. But the really fucked up um, concerning aspect of this to me is that this is not the FATF straight up coming out and making these rulings themselves, making their own recommendations, assessing this and gauging the need for regulations themselves. It's a private company coming in and trying to instigate that themselves so that they can play the market into this regulated landscape where, oh, look, we're conveniently set up to fucking handle all of these regulations and do all of this for you. Hmm, that might give us an edge in this market. So yeah, um, that is a really greasy thing that we have seen uh, a lot in terms of exchanges and marketplace businesses like Coinbase trying to use regulations to their advantage like that. But um, apparently that attitude is now starting to creep into the mining ecosystem too. That all sounded very gross. It was a combination of financial surveillance dis disguised as hyper-environmentalism, my favorite. 
Mm -hmm. But you know what I mean? Like this push for these things are coming and it didn't even come from the regulators themselves. Just some greasy company um, <laughs> trying to shift the entire landscape to their benefit through regulation. And realistically, you know, the only thing to really do here in a, in a practical way to respond to this is decentralized mining pools. Um, anything else is really just playing um, whack-a-mole. Um, and, you know, you're probably eventually going to get whacked. I don't want to whack these people. Hey, that might get misinterpreted here now. I don't think that's what you meant. Slapped it. But yeah, it's like... Should I whack first? <laughs> but like, it's it's like, seriously, like, this is... This is a really important issue. And, like, people need to start looking at Bitcoin in terms of the different layers of it. The marketplaces, the miners, the transactional use. Every one of these scales independently to some degree... Um, to the others like it's its own thing that scales or doesn't scale based on what is done or developed on that layer and like people need to realize if all of those layers don't scale don't decentralize enough then that can domino to undermine other ones you know if things like this happen like fast forward five years um kyc you know, tagged miners, everything is a controlled registered ecosystem. Um, do you think there's going to be any guarantee of censorship resistance on the blockchain at that point? I mean, that's the only uh, use case I see for doing this type of bullshit. <laughs> is more censorship. Mm -hmm. Which is a big no-no. They can all go away. We don't want it. But the sad reality is they probably won't. And to get around this, like the, this is not a problem that you can solve by just not doing things or opting out of things. Like things actually need to be proactively built here to negate stuff like this or it's going to happen. There's the dose of Shinobi pessimism for the day. I do there will believe... be more where that came from later. Well, later, maybe. But I do believe for now you have something that might cheer me up. Well, you all may recall that uh, Shinobi and I did a video back in March 2018 about the different types of ASIC boost and a thing called the Blockchain Defensive Patent License that Little Dragon Technology put the non-controversial type of ASIC boost under in order to discourage patent aggression in the Bitcoin space. And on September 10th, Square Crypto and Blockstream announced that they were forming a new crypto open patent alliance along the same lines at uh, open uh, hyphen patent or open dash patent.org. Um, and to, uh, so on Twitter, they said today Square is announcing the formation of the Cryptocurrency Open Patent Alliance or COPA. As you know, the Square Crypto to Cash App or from Square Crypto to Cash App, Square is in the fight to keep Bitcoin and crypto free and open. The way to do this is to make sure that the tech driving both is available to everyone. The success of cryptocurrencies, as with any new technology, depends on people being able to build what they want, which is not possible when every new idea gets tied up by patent litigation. There is growing concern that patent lockup could stifle innovation and adoption from Bit to the most obscure cryptocurrency. In order to tackle this problem, the crypto community will need to once again uh, do what it is so famous for and come together for the greater good. COPA is an industry-wide invitation to the patent equivalent of an open source community its two-pronged approach includes one a pledge that no member will ever assert their patents on foundational cryptocurrency technology except defensively and two the creation of a shared library that lets members use each other's patents as needed defensively given uh even small companies a sh or giving even small companies a shield with which to protect themselves against patent aggressors as more companies join and the shared patent library grows, the free will be to pursue crypto's future. 
is a good faith gesture. We'll be making the first move and move and opening all of our crypto patents for uh, future COPA members to use. And um, uh, I don't know if this was the first company to join. I didn't look to see if any others had joined, but on September 11th, our favorite day, um, yesterday, Blockstream tweeted that they too would be committing all of their existing patents to COPA. Yeah, this is pretty awesome. And I'm actually kind of hopeful that this picks up steam where things like this haven't in the space. You know, just like Square is really starting to do and fund a lot of dev work here. And Blockstream's already been at it for years. Like the two of these companies together with what they cook up, um, maybe that's actually a large enough pool and enough useful things to incentivize other companies in the space to start getting involved. Like, um, I, I do believe, I think I saw um, um, Daniel from Microsoft the the DID department over there um, responded to Samson mentioning um, some common shareholders between Microsoft and Blockstream and him pushing for um, Microsoft to push all of their decentralized identity patents into this pool as well. So that would be a pretty awesome thing to see. That would be good because the last thing I would want to see is for control of those types of things to fall under consensus. And by consensus, I do not mean the group decision making. I mean the company. Mm -hmm. And like, really, the one thing I would like to see is like some thought and pretty much like more structure and something with more teeth in terms of like committing these patents in a pool um in perpetuity you know what i mean like don't leave exit clauses or different excuses that companies could use to effectively pull out of this agreement like continue as this uh grows like looking at options to make this like something you can't back out of you know what i mean or um consider like the potential of like a, a company going under and patents changing hands like you know what i mean that's something i'm kind of a little worried about in the long term is you know what happens if some business goes under that has some very valuable patents in this space and an arrangement like this offers them a, a way to kind of pull out of this agreement well, the only other thing I have to say about this is to give the anarchist perspective because I can't resist. And that is uh, Jamie Lewis, uh, Sarah Jamie Lewis saying, I don't care about patents, violate all the patents, kill the cop in your head. Yeah, with, without getting into the long rant of my thought on intellectual property, I think that patents as a class of that is just illegitimate. But this is the world that we live in. I believe she also said cypherpunks write code and care about patent lockup or something along those lines. <laughs> those are the rules, kids. The new rules. Alrighty. So are we ready for some poo-poo? <sighs> are we ready for some what? You cut off there for me. Some poo-poo. Oh, you mean shisa. Uh, CVE 2018-17145, a denial of service attack uh, on Bitcoin Core that was dropped three days ago at this point um, and existed since some period in 2018 um, with versions 0.16 and 0.16.1 of Bitcoin Core as well as 0.16 of knots um a lot of versions of bcoin a javascript implementation um all versions of btcd a go implementation below 0.20.1 uh litecoin 0.16 uh namecoin 0.16.1 and a large swath of versions of decred and so really, um, the, the actual specific details um, kind of vary between different implementations. Um, 
there's a short uh, release paper that goes into all of that um, in detail if you guys want to take a look at that. But the general gist uh, of this is that for all these implementations in different ways, um, they did not cap memory um, resource use um, when, in regards to the, the propagation of transactions. So in the peer-to-peer -peer layer, if I want to send you a transaction, I would send an invoice with a hash of that transaction, the transaction ID. And then if you need it, um, I would send the actual transaction um, in a separate message right after that. Um, the problem here is that um, below a max limit in terms of um, how many items can be passed here, I could spam you with 49,999 instances of random hashes that aren't actually transactions um, and never send um, any transaction data with that and pretty much just blow up the memory um, use of your node until it crashed, um, it seized up when the uh, memory was eaten up and swap space started being used and, and pretty much just, you know, knock a node offline. Um, and now theoretically, um, this could have been used in some nasty attacks. Um, a very, you know, wide, uh, a well-resourced attacker um, could have tactically tried to partition the network um, if they were able to map it enough and actually um, spam vulnerable nodes at uh, important connection points and just cleave the network in half. Um, this could have been used to take mining operations offline by crashing their nodes and costing them a lot of money. Um, you could have even theoretically tried to do something um, like pull a reorg attack by eclipsing um, an exchange or something using this crashing nodes around it and then feeding it uh, malicious data or like well, malicious data in the sense of a block not in the longest chain um, that's not going to wind up in the longest chain um, so this this could have um, been abused in a really bad way by an attacker with a lot of resources but this has um, not been observed and there's really no indication that this was ever pulled in the wild and the reason it kind of took so long to be disclosed is really just the slow uptick in adoption and the uh, you know number of patch nodes in the network but you know, I, I would definitely not call this as bad as the inflation bug that allowed inputs to be spent twice in a single transaction, but this could have had some pretty nasty consequences for the network, especially given the fact that we are pushing into the territory now with the size, the threat it pre er, presents. There are a lot of incentives for well-resourced attackers like that to come at Bitcoin. And, you know, this could have been a really bad one if they had noticed this. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, on especially in light of all the uh, the blacklist um, drama going around, you know, it just goes to show like that code base it needs more eyes it needs more people auditing reviewing things and i don't mean um starting flame wars in github repos like it's twitter i mean actually looking at the code and looking for problems in it sorry about that i forgot to mute my obnoxious phone me too <laughs> you don't have a phone true but yeah um you know i think there there really needs to be a better balance there of people reviewing changes before it actually gets deployed in releases but uh not really uh go off the deep end into twitter mobs migrating to github because that's not going to help uh catch things like this that's actually probably going to make it worse and more likely things like this would happen so that is uh 
that is going to be a rough balance to try and strike. Also, hey, just in general, this is a good time to say thank you, Vladimir. Because everyone's already said that, and I already said it, but I'm going to say it again. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, yeah. Thank you, and uh, I am very glad that he has spent the time that he has um, actually maintaining this. Um, and also, um, for being one of the only people um, employed by MIT in this space that I actually trust. Ditto. Alrighty, though. Got some bad news out of the way, and yep, I structured it so there's some good news right after that. What's the good news? Schnorr. So after a long wait since September 2018, when the pull request was originally opened, it is finally here, boys and girls and everything in between. Yesterday, Peter Wool tweeted that BIP340, uh, the Schnorr signatures BIP, has been merged in Libsec P256K1. Master, for anyone who doesn't know, that is the C library for ECDSA signatures and secret public key operations on the curve that Bitcoin uses. So yes, Schnorr is coming. It's right around the corner. Still some tests being done, but basically here. Woo! And like, yeah. Uh, on the note of, of saying thank you, Vlad, I would like to thank um, Nickler and SIPA and GMAX and all the people over the years who have actually, you know, helped build out and maintain that library because, uh, one, there was a lot of optimizations gotten out of that, but two, um, like really sensitive cryptographic operations like that, I much prefer that being its own implementation in the Bitcoin code base rather than something pulled from somewhere maintained by some people um, without the kind of scrutiny that that is generally given to things in this ecosystem. So. Yeah, I, th I think that Bitcoin's threat model would be very different if uh, that library had never been written. I can just, I can just feel all the, well, yeah, so my uh, headline, I think, for the newsletter about this is going to be Schmore Schnorr, because apparently S'mores is short for some more, some more, it's hard to say, in... <laughs> Woo! Just give me Schnorr. I want more private smart contracts. I want more efficient smart contracts. I want things that I can do that never get revealed on chain. I can feel the IRS and the blockchain surveillance companies sweating. Boom, boom, boom. Before we get into, I guess, how much they're sweating, real quick, uh, Another awesome thing um, in the optimistic sense. Uh, so Francis uh, Pouye um, and Kexki um, from Bull Bitcoin and Satoshi Portal have just open sourced um, a Cypher node plugin uh, called Batcher. And this is something that they've been building out for their own backends for a while now and have released for general use to the public. Um, it's just an automated um, plugin for the, the Cypher node framework. Um, pretty much like a services package you drop on top of a core uh, to handle automated batching for businesses. Um, and this is really nice. It's self-hosted, um, simple API, um, logs and... Uh, records for things in progress kept in a very detailed amount um, native support for taking let's say um, a customer introduces a, a few different uh, withdrawal requests or requests before a batch transaction actually hits chain um, can roll those into a single output so you're not just peppering people with dust outputs um, you can actually run um, a config policy for how you want to structure and handle that. Um, you can run multiple um, 
configuration policies for different batching transactions simultaneously. Um, you can set up amount or time thresholds. So um, say every 10 minutes, um, submit a batch transaction to chain or every time a transaction in net um, is now sending out over X Bitcoin, push that to chain. And it's just a very simple thing. You can just drop in, um, you know, hook up to the API of, and we get off to using it. And some of the savings are really pretty impressive. Um, so first off, the, the thing that it does um, regarding change outputs is try to minimize the creation of those. And that has huge benefits for long strings of unconfirmed transactions. Because once you hit more than 25 transactions dependent on unconfirmed ones, further transactions um, built on that chain are invalid in the mempool. So batching allows you to minimize the, the risk of things like that happening. And just overall, in terms of optimization, um, he, he kind of ran the numbers for bull Bitcoins um, business in the release announcement for this. And that's kind of a non-custodial thing that very rapidly um, you know, gets a request for a purchase, it sends it to the user um, as soon as possible. There is no long-term custodian aspect to it. Um, so they couldn't do um, hundreds of transactions per hour. Um, well, boiling down to 24 um, transactions a day using this batch protocol um, over the course of a year, um, you know, the numbers that Francis runs show a saving of over 100 Bitcoin in fees by using this. And really, um, I do have to respect um, kind of the way he's framing this as well, because at the end of this write up, one of the first things that he points out here is that while this is scalable or scaling in terms of the cost and the efficiency of things, um, you are kind of showing everybody involved in a batch transaction like this that all of these other outputs um, are also bull Bitcoin customers. So he is recommending users keep that in mind um, of the service and take uh, you know the extra steps to actually mix things and obscure future connections that other bull Bitcoin users could get um, in terms of your funds. And they also... Um, kind of in the uh, the process of rolling through this, actually do mix their own outputs through Wasabi to kind of attempt to partition and minimize the degree that connections like that can happen. And um, they're also looking in terms of future development, um, <clears throat> more integration and thinking around RBF flagging all of these by uh, default. So that rather than having to hold on to a transaction um, and then only submitting it after some finalization criteria that's set, it could just dump um, a transaction as is into the mempool with a low fee. And if uh, you know another withdrawal is instigated, then add that and bump the fee. And pretty much actually just constantly have... Um, you know, some transaction in the mempool awaiting confirmation that can be updated until the last second of a block being found. And um, yeah, so this is really awesome. And just in terms of the fact that he open sourced this, this is a baller ass move. Um, and I'm really glad to see rather than Francis just kind of keep this to himself. Um, you know, I'll save money for my business. He's open sourcing the whole thing just to help scale, you know, access and use of the, the chain by businesses in general beyond his own business's savings. So I really like, you know, props to Francis for that. That's pretty fucking awesome. Ooh. All right. I think there was something about tiers of government employees. 
Yes, the sweat is dripping. So on, I think this was September 4th, the Criminal Investigation Division of the IRS published uh, Pilot IRS Cryptocurrency Tracing, a request uh, a request for proposal on ways to break privacy coins. Now, this is very similar to the request for information that the unit put out at the end of June, which I covered in the July issue of my Bitcoin privacy newsletter. And I believe this is basically the same people because I the the language in the document that comes with the uh, request in the contracting database is very similar to the in, to the um, introduction in that document when they made the initial request. So it, um, basically, they published a request for information regarding systems that will allow developers and testers to conduct investigative research on distributed ledger transactions involving privacy, cryptocurrency coins, layer two off-chain protocol networks, side chains, tracing challenges following the integration of the Schnorr signature algorithm. Um, so that was from the previous one, and it appears that no one either sufficiently or at all responded to that request, so they're doing it again. They, uh, in this new request, write that the IRSCI, the Criminal Investigation Division, is seeking a solution with one or more contractors to provide innovative solutions to sing, um, and attribution of privacy coins and layer two off-chain transactions, such as expert tools, data, source code, algorithms, and software development services to assist the cyber crimes agents in carrying out their mission as it relates to cryptocurrency privacy technologies support one of the outlined initiatives on monero or layer two network protocol transactions um, or other cryptocurrency obfuscation techniques or technologies um, and they also say that under the overall direction of the director of cyber crimes or their designee the contractor shall provide weekly status reports of progress to include major accomplishments, upcoming tasks, issues, or concerns. The contractor shall work with uh, CI cybercrimes personnel, special uh, cyber, spe cyber special agents. Oh, that is such a great name. I want to be a cyber special agent. Um, then functional points of contact and other personnel, including other contractors, to gather and synthesize data and other inputs as needed. All documentation, data, source code, and software developed shall be provided to IRSCI. The primary goals of this solution challenge are to provide information and technical capabilities for the CI special agents to trace transaction inputs and outputs. Ooh, they know what inputs and outputs are. To a specific user and differentiate them from mix-ins slash multi-sig actors for Monero and or Lightning Layer 2 cryptocurrency transactions with minimal involvement of external vendors uh they also number two want to provide technology which uh given information about specific parties and or transactions in the monero and or lightning networks allows special agents to predict statistical likelihoods of other transaction inputs outputs metadata and identifiers with minimal involvement of external vendors and finally number three provide algorithms and source code to allow ci to further develop modify and integrate these capabilities with internal code and systems with minimal cost licensing issues or dependency on external vendors the document is a lot longer than that but that is basically the description of what they want so hey is there anyone out there can you hear me anyone out there listening to a lot of pink floyd sorry <laughs> Yeah, um, this is just fucking hilarious. <laughs> like, first off, um, the that amount of money is a joke <laughs> in terms of building out a system that could do that, and it's worth absurdly more than that. Um, probably in just a number of like different reasons, aside from outright trying to attack or, or steal from somebody, just information is a very valuable thing in a market <laughs> and two it's it's hilarious to me um that they think anybody in this space um competent enough to do that um in a real systematic way would give a shit to do that for them and three it's like th this is more and more um going in like that snow crash direction in terms of what this country looks like bureaucratically. Um, 
Like, I think if the IRS wants to have any kind of effectiveness in making sure that people aren't just um, doing whatever the hell they want with uh, cryptocurrencies with no recourse to anything, they're going to have to in-house actually competent software engineers, actually competent data engineers. Um, and they're going to need to build a core team of that. Um, not just competent in those fields in general, but competent in these specific cryptographic systems in this ecosystem. And the idea that that could actually be accomplished, I mean, it's hilarious. Like, I really think it's going to boil down to some kind of analog um, of what, you know, a, a lot of people in the um, the intelligence communities deal with um, trying to go after recruit like a lot of these, you know, self-taught like hacker kids. It's like, OK, um, you want me to work for the government? Well, I smoke weed. Um, what, what are your thoughts about that? Oh, that's a problem. Sorry, I don't want to do that then. Yeah. Speaking of intelligence agency recruiting, um, did you see the story about how uh, Keith Alexander is now at Amazon? Mm -hmm. Just another uh, brick being laid in the founding of the corporate states of America. Don't you mean another brick in the wall? Yes, yes, if we're sticking with the Pink Floyd team. That, that is more appropriate. Yeah, so to quote S Snowden, um, the uh, Hey Alexa trigger is apparently short for Hey Alexander. <laughs> yeah, so because um, you mentioned the the amount and actually I hadn't mentioned the amount. So yeah, the IRS, uh, the deadline for applying for this thing is September 16th. So, you know, you... Uh, so they put this out on the 4th. You basically were given two weeks to make a decision <laughs> about whether you wanted to build something like this for the IRS. And, and they offer a, a two-phase bounty. Um, they say first an initial $500,000. No, this is a, actually a summary from Decrypt, but they say it was initial $500,000 payment for developing and providing a working concept of the tool within eight months after the proposal acceptance, Jesus, and um, 125000 after the pilot test is completed and approved by the government. So if that sounds attractive, um, you better get to it because <laughs> you don't have much time. I think it would be hilarious if a bunch of people just started spamming proposals for like different specs or designs that were just like off or wrong or wouldn't work properly, but do their best to try and make it seem like they would and just DDoS them with garbage proposals with flaws in them. <laughs> yeah, so I have I have a proposal. So I have heard recently in an interview, well, not an interview, but a debate um, that was held between um, Alex Gladstein and uh, Cypher Trace founder dude who I can't remember the name of Dave Dave something I there's too many Daves in the world um, in that debate he mentioned that apparently some Monero people uh, regularly meet with them now I don't know if that's true I don't he might just be pulling it out of his ass but if that is true <laughs> um, I have a suggestion uh, for these Monero people to troll not only whatever blockchain surveillance company may attempt to um, to accept this proposal or go after this proposal, I suggest that you tell them it's entirely possible and, you know, let them build out something under whatever advice you want to give them and make sure you, you get a cut of this money and then it won't work. I just, I just, you know, I don't know, just so many, so many, uh, so many opportunities to troll the government. Don't let them go to waste. Yeah, it's, it's just going to be funny. Like, you know, <clears throat> there are some practical attacks that you could pull on Monero, but it's not really, uh, <laughs> the same thing as analyzing an open chain and then the lightning network. Oh boy, dude. Like how how do you you can't do that? You can't build an analysis system like that 
unless you participate in the lightning network. So like, is the IRS going to start running lightning routing nodes? You know what I mean? Like, is the U.S. government going to have to buy Bitcoin and route payments on the Lightning Network? And if they actually do realize that's what they have to do and start doing it, then what happens when um, the spec starts incorporating more private ways to handle things, you know, like rendezvous routing? Or what happens when timing analysis, um, you know, negations get worked into the spec? Um, is the IRS going to upgrade their nodes to support those things? Or are they going to just stand out as sore thumbs that refuse to support those things? Like, how is that going to work long term? The the image I just had in my head was some poor soul of an IRS agent um, setting up a lightning node. And then the node name is like IRS. And then they're just like asking around, hey, who wants to open channels with me? <laughs> <laughs> make sure you pay your taxes guys on all your microtransactions i know it's like i'm serious though it's like you know what i mean there like there are attacks you can pull on lightning but developers are going to build in you know tools to counteract that so what happens when that happens like what are you going to do irs are you, are you just going to keep routing payments for everybody like <laughs> what are you going to do do you either undermine the entire reason you would be on the Lightning Network or stand out like a sore thumb and make it very obvious who you are on the Lightning Network? And while you're at it, get some sats back. <laughs> make sure you declare it. Gotta what if, declare every cent. What if they just give up and they just start running routing nodes as a way to make any kind of money? <laughs> I think it would be funny. It, what what is that messaging? Um, there's a messaging app for Lightning. It would be really funny if they just started spamming other Lightning nodes with, "Hey, have you paid your taxes?" <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, yeah. There's going to be a lot of popcorn to come come out of this one. I think. Alrighty though. Uh... IRS agents are like onions. They have layers. All right, though. All right. Uh, so what? What's this new website that uh, Bitcoin Q and A set up? Oh, oh yes. So you all know, as you, I mean, if you didn't know before this episode, you probably know now after listening to some of the stories I've given. But um, I am a fan of avoiding services that require KYC because those are privacy holes, and life is just a lot less scary with fewer privacy holes. Uh, however, apparently a lot of people still find it very hard to acquire and use Bitcoin without doxing themselves to everyone and their mother. So Bitcoin Q&A has made that process a little bit easier by compiling a bunch of resources on, you know, kind of a basic rundown of what KYC is, the kinds of things that gets that get collected, the risks of uh, giving that kind of information to everyone and their mother, and services that you can use um, alternatively that actually respect your privacy, like BISC, and um, also, you know, some suggestions about uh, premiums or difficulties you may encounter in the process. So... Um, as he says, he or she, they says on the website, um, avoid the creep, go no KYC only. Yeah, this is definitely something, um, you know, like I, I have always said this whenever this topic came up, that the first thing anybody should consider in this space um, is whether they're okay with some record existing somewhere that they bought Bitcoin. And you know, when I first got into this space, there were a lot more options for that. It was a lot easier to do, and it has just been getting more and more difficult to really find those types of options. And yeah, things like this that really look at all the available options, like really kind of walk people through the, the thinking here. This is an absolutely necessary thing in this space right now. And I mean, ultimately, if somebody is going to choose they're okay with that record existing, um, then they're just going to go to a, you know, KYC exchange and they're going to do that anyway. But 
you know, at least kind of put the option in front of people, make it not a, a progressively more and more absurd, like set of hoops you have to jump through so that that can be an actual choice and not looking at a minefield of stuff to figure out versus just walking into a door. Mm-hmm. So, woo woo. Also, it's going to be nice when Hoddle Hoddle finally moves to America. When the hell is that happening? Come on. Alrighty. So, are we ready for some degenerate gambling breaking news? Breaking news. So, uh, Nicholas Dorier of BTC Pay and Chris Stewart of Sherdbits um, <laughs> have entered into the first on-chain uh, DLC with a, uh, a certain owl um, acting as the signing oracle for this. And uh, yeah, um, they're betting on the outcome of the, uh, <laughs> the U.S. presidential election. And uh, yeah, this is dope as shit, awesome shit. Like we've talked uh, quite a few times about DLCs um, as stuff was getting built out in terms of the the spec software for it, and uh, yeah. So Nicholas used the uh, digital garage client um, tweaked for mainnet because that's testnet only, and Chris used uh, the DLC implementation in uh, Bitcoin Scala that Sheredbits has been working on. And so these these are the two different companies who have actually been doing most of the work and collaborating on specking this out and uh, you know proven compatibility between their software stacks, which is always nice. And um, yeah, so now a, a certain owl, um, after the outcome of the election, will sign the magic message of either Republican win, Democrat win, or other. And then Chris and Nicholas will be able to trustlessly close this contract out. And, um, you know, whoever bet on Trump is obviously going to get some free Bitcoin here. <laughs> but it's just, uh, yeah, I don't know. I kind of find it personally hilarious that you have this whole world of financial products and complicated contracts uh, that can be built out using this type of protocol. And the first thing, yep. Who's going to be the United States president? Well, see, if I was to uh, participate in a bet like that, um, I would want there to be an option where you bet that everyone loses because that is a guaranteed win. We Not all as guaranteed lose. as Trump. <laughs> all right. All right. I, I couldn't help myself. The so, guaranteed uh, loser is always us. Yes, but the guaranteed winner this time is the God Emperor. <laughs> All right, last one. I swear, I swear it's the last one. Alrighty. Uh, so I guess uh, before a long rant um, from Shinobi about irresponsible dumb shit, um, a quick update on the sad, sad state of Bitmain. Uh, so... McCree's uh, fork of the company um, has announced that they are going to be building out uh, five nanometer chips for their newest mining machines. Um, and this is not really being received well by a lot of customers. And <clears throat> even so far, um, Jihan is claiming that the only reason he is moving to five nanometers is because he has lost in the supply chain um, snafus access to uh, seven nanometer fabrication. And a lot of miners and customers are kind of not really uh, on board with this. Um, one, Moving to a lower nanometer is going to have risks, um, first off, as far as design flaws, uh, manufacturing flaws. Um, so there's always things that can go wrong there um, as well. Um, there's still a shit ton of, you know, 7, 12 nanometer equipment that could be run very profitably and acquired very cheaply on the secondhand markets. And really with... Um, 
you know, how competitive mining is getting, you know, this, this is really starting to mature into a global, you know, efficient market. Um, people are thinking longer term. And so a lot of miners are really just looking at McCree trying to sell the dream of a five nanometer chip and going, I don't care. Um, what I have works, it'll be profitable, it's cheap, and I'm not willing to risk a, a sizable capital investment on new technology that could fail, that could have problems um, that might not even be delivered to some degree, depending on how bad those problems are. So uh, yeah. Um, things do not look good at all for Bitmain. If uh, the general announcement of a, a new, um, you know, jump forward in equipment efficiency usually draws attention in sales. And if, you know, that's not going um, this time around, then yeah, I don't really see how this company doesn't just implode on itself in the next year or so. Like they have literally forked themselves in half um destroyed their balance sheet destroyed their reputation and now that's finally coming back to bite them in the ass in that you know their main customer base doesn't even want to buy the new product that they have out really because they can just go get things that work well enough on the secondhand market <laughs> it happens when you party in communist china yes a lot of shit Alrighty, so this last one, um, I am really, really infuriated by this. And I think personally, just the way that this uh, post uh, by Breeze Wallet was written is ridiculously irresponsible. Um, they put out a, a medium piece um, called Lightning is the Better Way to HODL. And they pretty much, um, you know, semantically through most of this piece, slowly equate to hodling um, or hodling to just the simple fact of not spending your coins. And they do a very subtle good job of disconnecting that act of not spending from um, how securely you are actually storing what you are not spending. And pretty much try to make the argument um, that you can hodl by running a routing node on the Lightning Network in a hot wallet with keys on a general purpose device connected to the internet automatically signing things. And equate that to hodling something in terms of keeping your investment safe for the long term because you do not intend to spend it rather than exposing yourself to risks. And they even go so far um, in one of their recommendations at the bottom of this article um, to recommend running a lightning node in the cloud to hodl where your keys that actually control your funds would be sitting in a cloud instance running on somebody else's hardware. And then at the bottom, they, they do have a little caveat about how well having a hot wallet running isn't the same as a, a air gapped uh, cold storage solution. But hey, you know, <laughs> just recognize that difference and hodl on the Lightning Network. Like this is so greasily irresponsible and just fucking stupid. Like this, this is pretty much <clears throat> something, and, and people are. A decent number of people are probably going to listen to this and say I'm making a mountain out of a molehill because HODL, who says what HODL is? And it's about the fact that there are so many people in this ecosystem who don't really fully grasp these things. They don't understand nuanced trade-offs. They just kind of look at what is, is put in front of them, what is recommended to them. And frankly, the fact that a, a company that's offering services on the Lightning Network is trying to equate having a hotkey routing node on the Lightning Network with hodling is ridiculous. That is irresponsible. And there are going to be people out there who just think, okay, that sounds good. And they do this without thinking through the security consequences. They do this without being able to manage the security consequences. Th this is just irresponsible, point blank. 
like until there is actually demonstrated battle tested hardware to manage keys and signing for lightning nodes that are always online you're taking a risk you are hit, taking a massive security degradation for the chance to get more return on your investment that's not hodling and that's not secure in terms of keeping your investment safe for the long term and the fact that a company out there is trying to equate those two things to nudge people into running routing nodes go fuck yourself if you want people to do that explain the trade-offs and the risks clearly and first without trying to downplay them and do this nonsense equivocation game and then let them make up their own mind but the framing in this article is so fucking irresponsible yeah i mean yeah hodl doesn't necessarily mean cold storage but i feel like lightning is the polar opposite of that and it doesn't really even fit with what hodl means which is to just hold on to your coins and let them sit there and not do anything with them which does not fit with lightning because obviously you have open active channels like funds are moving around even if yes you still technically have the keys but yeah that doesn't make any sense to me and to say oh yeah there is a difference between um air gapped and lightning it's like yeah duh they're like the complete opposite of each other <laughs> so yeah that was very bad and, you know, like I, I would love to see more people running routing nodes and providing liquidity for the Lightning Network, but I would rather people do that understanding the risks and knowingly accepting them, not because of some equivocating meme campaign like this to just nudge people into doing it while downplaying the risks and the differences between things until the very end with a little a little caveat there. So, yeah. Um, fuck Breeze Wallet. Um, that was ridiculously greasy and irresponsible. Um, fuck Breeze Wallet. All right. Shinobi rant done. Unless you got something else to add to this. Final thoughts time. That was a breeze. <laughs> or maybe Febreze. Smelly. All right, though. Come on. Load of thought. Uh, well, something, I mean, it's kind of a thought, something I'm looking forward to is that I've been hearing, uh, you know, the past week or so that there is a, a certain um, leak uh, coming of uh, FinCEN financial records uh, that is apparently being worked on by the ICIJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, which if anyone doesn't know, that's the same consortium that um, helped to publish the Panama Papers and the database that allows you to look through it and everything. So that is going to be quite interesting, in, especially if it includes any Bitcoin stuff. Um, and so that's why you may have seen a statement from FinCEN saying, this is very illegal, this bad people, but it is happening. Yeah, that is something I am very interested in seeing. Mm. My brain is incapable of loading a thought right now. Well, I guess uh, I guess we'll just say then. Um, congratulations to whoever uh, voted for Trump in the DLC bet. Um, it's going to be really nice, you know, getting free bitcoins. Always is. And uh, yeah, and, and enjoy uh, enjoy your winnings when Mister Orange Man apparently takes the throne again um the other thought that i also had is uh yeah there is way too much to update about what has happened in the assange case in the last week but let me give a summary um yeah basically there was some really kick-ass witnesses i think they were day three 
um, Trevor Tim and what's his name? I'm going to have to look it up now. Um, I think it was Paul Rogers was the other. Yes, I think he was the other one. He was a professor of um, political science and international peace, I think. Um, if you can get their defense statements, they've been published uh, afterwards, I think. Um, you should be able to find them if you just search for it, probably like the Courage Foundation, but um, they kicked the prosecution's butt. Um, the prosecution also, well, something that very ha happened um, very recently with the prosecution is um, the junior counsel on the team uh, basically called in, uh, well, I don't know how she notified the court, but somehow she notified the court uh, on the morning of Thursday, which would have been day four of the proceedings, and basically said that her husband was exhibiting COVID-like symptoms. So, um, yes. Yeah, uh, basically the hearings almost got canceled and forced everyone into quarantine because uh, no one in the court is wearing masks which seems unbelievably stupid to me. Um, and I can't believe they didn't anticipate that happening. Uh, the hearings almost got postponed because a member of the U.S. prosecution team, who is actually a British woman, basically all of the prosecution members who are at the court physically are um, British lawyers hired on behalf of the U.S. prosecution team. And yes, apparently they were very close to almost all of a bunch of them getting COVID, which is kind of bizarre. I mean, the m main reason it's bizarre is because when the proceeding started before any of had been called, the defense actually argued that the, um, the hearings should be postponed until I think January because uh, literally on the first morning on Monday, uh, a superseding indictment was a new superseding indictment. This is now the third one. So there was the first indictment, and then there was another superseding indictment, and then now this one that was just served on him on Monday. He was arrested just as he came into court under this new superseding indictment. And, of course, his defense lawyers were like, well, there is now a new superseding indictment. We should be given more time to actually prepare and research for this you know we should do that and the judge was like well you were told that the superseding indictment was coming weeks ago and you didn't um you didn't say anything then therefore you have lost your chance which is amazing because the fact that the superseding indictment even came up is very well counter to justice because uh they submitted it past the deadline for doing that kind of thing so she apparently gave the prosecution a pass to serve a new superseding indictment but she didn't give the defense a pass to extend the amount of time that is given to actually review it so that is the update for the first week um almost got canceled by coronavirus Joy, because that's totally a reasonable thing when you have data sets like uh, the U.S. college with 26,000 positive tests and not a single hospitalization. It's still reasonable to do things like that, right? Yeah. Well, I guess, uh, yeah, I'm still kind of blank on uh, extra thoughts today. So on that note... Uh, Call it quits and catch you later, punks. Bye. The God Emperor will rise. Shh. <laughs>